what's going on here. Oh geez, look at this. How do, you, how do you park like that? What a jackass. I have to uh, put a note on this guy's car. Sorry about the hand. What's going on with the phone all of a sudden? Okay, listen, I have to, I had to, I had to get, gain control of my childlike exuberance. Man, there's some really bad parking here. I got the, the car on this side. This chick's like three feet from the curb. <laughs> Terrible. So yesterday I got all excited about the possibility of putting a straight axle in the van. Uh, and I got a couple negative comments from older guys, and it's okay, I understand. I mean, that's your opinion. You're not wrong, but you also don't, you're seeing it from your own perspective. And, and I can't blame you for that. That's what all human beings do, right? You're thinking about it from your own perspective. <laughs> But you're not seeing, I guess, the things that I do with this van and the places I've taken it and the issues I've been having when I come home from some crazy off-road trip. Now, it took me a while doing the due diligence on the CV axles to where I finally discovered... Uh, and I've got a bunch of videos on this. Go to the you know, Astro Van CV Axle videos. I, I'm sure i got a playlist on it. And a lot of times at first I was trying to get the best deal. And I was having problems with boots tearing. And it wasn't because of extreme angles. It was just because they were inexpensive CV axles. And the boot quality was garbage. So I've got at least two maybe three sets of cv axles where i've got torn boots and you can buy a replacement boot kit that comes with a high quality neoprene rubber and the grease and everything so you can just take cut those boots off you can replace them it's a process there's these uh steel <clears throat> clips you need a tool i bought all that stuff to do that and rebuild the cv axles There's even a system, I don't want to get all into how to do that. If I ever do that, I'll make a video on how to do it. All right. But um, then somebody reached out to me and they were pointing out how Napa sells apparently like a more heavy duty version. So I called Napa and I got those part numbers. And you have to understand Napa isn't making parts, right? They brand parts that already exist from other companies. So I found out one is GSP and the other is Cardone. Those are the two that they actually sell. And you always want to go to Rock Auto and cross-reference your manufacturers and numbers because Rock Auto typically, you don't know Rock Auto, it's rockauto.com. They typically have the best prices. Not always, but typically. <clears throat> the other problem I was having... Uh, when I go off road in this thing is with all you know I got a lift you know there's a little bit of an angle on my angle on my CVs right now is much lower because I lowered my front end because after I put the new bumper on the rear uh, that lowered the rear end a little bit and so it was too you know things weren't I, I, I fixed all that up <laughs> but one of the issues I was having was when I come home from an off-road trip, you pretty much your idler arms are shot, right? And there's a lot of different companies that make them, and I've tried, boy, I don't even know. I think I've had at least four sets of idler arms. One of them was busted by the Hooper's rear ends. We know that whole story. And then they put one on that didn't match the other one, and that probably had a thing going on because they actually the dimensions of them were a little bit different. You shouldn't do that. So... I replaced them again not long ago, and I haven't been on an off-road trip since then. However, there's another idler arm that looks different. And where the joint is, instead of just being two pieces, it's a much taller area, and there's a grease fitting in there on the side. And they were, they're kind of hard to find. And Rock Auto had them for a while, 
but they were real expensive. They were like $189 a piece. Now, one of my subscribers here, I don't know if he's a subscriber. Thank you, man. I forget who you are, what your name is. But he said he put those on and I mentioned how expensive they were. And he said, no, 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 they've got them on Summit Racing, I think for $89 a piece, something like that. So I went and I looked it up. He might have even sent me a link. And sure enough, so I, I saved that page and I, and, and you know, so they're there. Now, jump back to the, when I couldn't find a straight axle kit last year and I was doing all the uh, research on it, talking to people. That's when I first contacted this Tahoe overlanding guy. <clears throat> then, you know, I discovered these Timken, uh, I'm pretty sure it's Timken. If, I'm, if I got that company wrong, I apologize. But the, I discovered that there's that company and they're like an hour away from me that makes this heavy duty CV axle that extends in the shaft. And I reached out to them, I made a phone call first, then I did emails and everything else, and eventually they got back to me, and I ended up talking with, oh my god, I'm telling you, the stuff I see on the road here is insane. So I ended up talking with that guy on the phone, and he was pretty cool, I got the whole history, it actually, they didn't invent this idea but they got it from Volvo, like old Volvos had this system. They improved upon it, made it much better, chromoly and everything else. The idea here is, is that this CV axle that they've come up with, it's for four by four vehicles specifically with high lifts. <clears throat> part of your issue is on a regular CV axle, the part that goes into the uh, differential, it's a big thing you know, with these lobe systems that go into it. So there's only so much angle that you can get out of it where it'll be okay. But if you're riding at that extreme angle, they wear out quicker and you can have problems there. So their system on both ends, it has an end that's more similar that where it goes in, where it fits into the wheel. And it's got more, more ball bearings and the way it works where it can't pull out of your differential is that sliding shaft section has a spring in it that's constantly forcing it into the differential. So that's how that system works. Now, they make them for a lot of different vehicles, but primarily the people buying them today are people with uh, Toyotas, right? The more modern uh, uh, Tacomas, that sort of thing. So, they also make them though, if you look at the list of uh, cars that Timken makes these axles for, these CV axles, they make them for a, uh, like a Jeep Cherokee or Jeep Liberty, which is actually not so dissimilar from the Astro van, but it obviously wouldn't fit the same vehicle. So as I'm talking to this guy and I'm getting all this knowledge, and I'm pretty certain I did a video on this at the time, he told me you have to understand, the all-wheel drive Astro van was never designed to do the things we're doing with it, with the lift and putting in the 4x4 four four transfer case, you know, selectable 4 high, 4 low, all that. <clears throat> he told me that uh, they hadn't really considered the Astro van because of that reason, but he understands what we're doing with it. So what he told me was is that if I brought the Astro van there, which I can drive to, uh, they'll get underneath the van, do all the measurements, and if there's enough clearance, that they would actually make me a set, and it sounded like they would just give me a set, probably even install it, because when we were doing the math, and I'm probably not gonna get the numbers right, he was able to look on the computer he has some lookup tool that tells you how many of a specific vehicle is still on the road. And all-wheel drive Astro vans, I think the third gen, there's not a lot. It might be like 18,000 or something. But I think there's overall all-wheel drive Astro vans on the road. It's something like 34,000 or something like that. Astro vans, all-wheel drive still on the road. So to him... If they used my van as a test vehicle for the fit to make sure there's the clearance, it makes sense for them to put this into their product line. 
Okay, so that's where I'm at right now. And I just hadn't had a chance to go over there and look. Now my thinking was, at the time, if I go with these extendable CV axles and the more heavy duty uh, idler arms, that could be a way for me to save money uh, and have a more robust front end on this vehicle. Makes sense. Uh, and yesterday's phone call just put me in a headspace why that all went out the window. I forgot about it because I just love talking to this guy so much. <laughs> and I was so excited. And the idea of having it be my van that it works out on was a thing. Like, that could be cool. S last night, thinking on it afterwards, again, you know, all men are little children inside. We're just boys, right? So it's easy for us to get, oh, oh, oh my God, I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I got a little over excited and did that video and I probably shouldn't have because I'm, I'm real remembering like maybe it makes more sense to go this other route. E okay, let's say I had to buy the Timken uh, axles. They're, I, I think they're between like three to five hundred dollars a piece, which is not inexpensive you can buy uh, CV axles now for the van for like $80, I believe, a piece. It might even be that much for a pair. It might be less, like a, less than $100 for a pair. I think that's what it is. I forget. So they're relatively inexpensive. And if you've done it enough, like I have, on my back in the driveway, I could do both my CV axles in two hours. So it's not you know, the end of the world to have to replace your CV axles, but it becomes a pain in the ass if you're going off road a lot and you have to do it. So, or because of the cheap rubber and all this other stuff. So I just, I'm getting tired of that crap. That's why the straight axle appeals to me. There is no question that independent front suspension handles better on the road. A dar, we know that. However, we also know there's a crap ton of straight axle vehicles Jeeps, namely, but Tahoes and Suburbans and all kinds of trucks, pickup trucks, everything else. There's a lot of vans out there. By the way, there are a lot of Astro vans where people have already converted to a 4x4 straight axle uh, conversion. They're on the road. People are using them. I've got a friend who owns one. He loves it. Drives it everywhere. So it's not a big deal. Now, the discussion between uh, all-wheel drive and a selectable 4x4, the transfer case swap, that's a whole other discussion. And another guy made a comment. Ah, I again, coming from your perspective, bro, I get it. <laughs> the all-wheel drive system, if it's working right, is really great if you're in wet areas and snowy areas because it kicks on on its own. It's a safe way to drive, and that's what it was designed for. Um, if you want your Astro van and you are not interested in doing the things I'm doing with it, then trying to make that system work well is better. It makes sense. That's not me. I don't care about it. I don't live in a snowy area. Now, if I'm in a, let's say I was up in the mountains and it's crazy snow, they're closing the mountain roads or whatever, I could put this in four high and drive on a snowy wet surface it'll work you know you don't want to have it in four wheel drive on a dry pavement you could potentially rip your front end out you don't want to do that so <clears throat> you have to be smart and aware but there's plenty of people that will put their vehicles into four wheel drive in snowy conditions it's a thing it's always been a thing um i had this originally when i bought this van it was you know all wheel drive that's why I bought it, so I could do all the things I've done to it. Turns out, I discovered later that my all-wheel drive was stuck on. I learned that through a bunch of different things that had happened, and so that was killing my gas mileage. <clears throat> when I went to the NP233 transfer case, uh, so now I'm driving around in two-wheel drive all the time, my uh, MPGs went way up before I did all the other stuff, before I re-geared it and put 32 inch tires and all of it. And that was like my best system on highway driving for miles per gallon, but it was shit in the city. 
since I went to 410 gears and 32 inch tires and got the new computer reflash, which also changed my shifting. The big part I think of the problem with poor fuel economy in the city is your shifting positions that are built into the factory system with the uh, computer because it takes too long for the vehicle to get out of first gear. So even if I hadn't done everything else I did, I would have still went to the computer guy and had him change the shifting positions. But having said all that, I have the, sh the shifting pattern position for RPM, however they do it, changed. So it shifts out of first a lot quicker. It's set for 40, 410 gears and 32 inch tires. And now my city uh, mileage, my MPGs in the city are at least a third better than it was before. So I'm only putting gas in this thing about every three weeks now in the city, driving it just as much as I always have. Um, that's been wonderful. And on the <clears throat> on the highway, it's it's still great. The, the, the thing about highway driving with this thing is where you lose your fuel economy, where it gets bad is getting to speed. Once you get to a speed, whether it's 65 miles an hour or 85 miles an hour, if I'm on a flat trajectory, just driving along, maintaining that speed, I'm getting anywhere from 16 to 24 miles per gallon, depending. And, uh, but with slow in traffic where you have to slow down and speed up, that's where it's hurting you. Or if I'm cruising and I hit a grade, it, the mileage drops or if I'm cruising and it's strong headwinds the mileage drops right as it would with any other vehicle so and it, like the the Goldilocks zone you know is like 40 to 50 or 40 to 55 in that range I'm even with little grades or whatever I mean the mileage is is ridiculous it's like 24 miles per gallon uh, which is pretty amazing. Again, that's 32 inch tires, 410 gears, two wheel drive. So I'm, I'm overall, I'm very happy with what I've done here. So what's the point of this video? This video is me telling you I'm slowing that down. I'll talk to the guy with the straight axle thing and I'll explain this to him. I think the smarter way from what I should do is maybe let him experiment on somebody else's van, right? Uh, cause he want, he's chomping at the bit to do it. He's got his reasons, which makes sense. <clears throat> but what I think I'll do is I'll get, go ahead and order the bigger, heavier duty, uh, idler arms. They're made by Dorman and I will, I'll provide you with the links for that and everything when I get them. And then, uh, I'll go over to the, I, I think it's Timken. I'll go over there and have them measure this up. And if the, the room is there, I won't order the new idle arms yet. I'll probably go there first. Uh, and then I'll get everything together and I'll either have them or myself if they make them, if they save me. By the way, the other thing I wanted to point out, I said it earlier, but I didn't get too into it. But the part where it goes into the, the wheel hub assembly, that end, the way you look at that, as I said, they kind of have that same sort of design where it goes into the differential and then the shaft that opens and closes has a spring in it that forces it into the diff so it doesn't fall out. That is specifically designed with high wearable, high wear parts in it, all the steel and everything, you know, chromoly and all the other good stuff. But it's also designed for a more of an extreme angle so it doesn't wear out on you. That's why these things are so good and so costly. <clears throat> If they will work in this van, it is smarter for me to stick with the independent front suspension with those heavy duty axles. And again, the more heavy duty idler arms. And I think that might be just a way to stick uh, for now. Because I, I, putting a straight axle in this thing wasn't about making it a rock crawler. That's the other thing. People jump to these conclusions they got something in their own brain. Eh, it's stupid to make an Astro Van a rock crawler. Bah, 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 bah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, I never said I was going to turn it into a rock crawler. I wasn't going with the straight axle because I wanted to make it a rock crawler. Yesterday, when I was talking to Dave about it, one of the things I came up with, because I've got quarter inch by four inch angle, long pieces of it. 
because I was thinking about reinforcing the unibody structure under the van, right? There's these two rails. They look like frame rails, but they're part of the unibody construction. They're, it's not super heavy duty. It's more robust than many other unibody vehicles out there, but it's not a solid frame. All wheel drive Astro van has the front clip, right? It's got a portion of a frame under it. That's what the, it's what cradles the engine. It's what the whole front suspension works off of, all of that. The benefits of having a front straight axle on the Astro van is um, just the the robust nature of real 4x4 with a straight axle. So you're not breaking and wearing out those parts when you're going over. But keep in mind, where you live might be different. But out here, there's a lot of desert areas where it's just boulder-strewn road. They're not even roads a lot of the time. You're on a road, you know, dirt road, path, whatever the hell. All of a sudden, it's miles of just boulder-strewn ridiculousness that can just destroy your vehicle. And it's hell on independent front suspension. Now, a Toyota Tundra, something like that. Other vehicles that are more modern and, or, you know, of course, Baja Racing that has all the latest technology. And it's a whole other discussion. But those vehicles are more robust enough to handle that. But the Astro van is not. So... Never intended it. I, I'm just getting tired of it, of replacing parts that wear because of where I take the thing. Now, this is my only vehicle. I don't have a bunch of money. You guys can go out and buy another beater or some, my buddy Dave's got the Suzuki Samurai with an exoskeleton on it and 35 inch tires and everything. That thing will go. He rolled down a mountain. You can see it on YouTube. Four times rolled over, landed on the tires and kept driving. It's not going to do that with this thing. <laughs> that doesn't even sound like fun to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the combination, imagine now if you had a Jeep front end in this thing with coil springs. Well, now one of the other things you could do is you get rid of the cross member. You replace the cross member right now that's carrying the transmission that's designed to dip down because it houses the back end of the torsion key suspension system that is stock with the instrument, which I'm still running. <clears throat> that is like a low hanging area there. So you could get rid of that and you could put a new cross member in to support the transmission and you're gonna gain three or four inches of clearance there. You could still come down where it's underneath the transmission pan and now the other thing is, is if you've got an all wheel drive Astro van that you're taking off road and you've done a lift, a body lift, and uh, maybe even you've gone with the MP233 transfer case, selectable four high, four low on the floor, right here, right next to me, then you should absolutely, 100%, no argument, go with the engine and transmission lift brackets that we've made, that Dave makes. David Vaughn Enterprises at gmail.com. If you want those, it's proven technology now. It works. Plenty of people are running it. Everybody's happy. What that does is, let's say you got three inch body spacers. Well, you can lift your transmission and engine back up into the body of the vehicle that far. What that does, it gives you three inches of clearance from the bottom of your oil pan, like the front part of your oil pan and the front axle, which is tremendous. And it'll never rub again. That's huge. What else does that do? Well, now when you look, there's that front cross member, right? Right underneath your front bumper. From that point to the cross member underneath the transmission, there's nothing hanging there. So I've gone on pretty, and I've got more, way more clearance than a Toyota Tacoma. Way more. Uh, I think I've, yeah, I mean, I've, you've seen it. Dimensions and everything else. Well, I, and I looked at my, my friend, just she just bought a 4x4 Toyota Tacoma, too. And I went underneath there. It's got a skid plate and everything. But I'm under here. I'm like, there's like no clearance compared to my van. It's nuts. So I've gone and done all this crazy off-road stuff without concern that I'm going to blow my oil pan out because it's no longer hanging below those two points. I intend on putting a skid plate in at some point. But now it's so easy. It's just a flat piece of steel. Right? We just have to find a way to reinforce it, and I've got my ideas. It's going to be very simple. It's not something I'm planning to work with Dave necessarily to sell as a product. I don't make any money off these engine brackets. <clears throat> Kai Mojave uh, you, uh, on Facebook, Japanese guy, super cool dude, had come up with this idea, made his own. 
I saw it, <clears throat> reached out to him. He sent me a set. They look kind of crudely done, but they work. Brought him to Dave. Dave being the friggin' 3D modeling uh, CAD genius, you know, that he is. He did that, figured it out, made his own jig. He can make him different heights if you want him for different reasons at different heights. We've been going back and forth with that. I went with a two inch. I've decided I'm going to put three inch lift in. So I'm going to lift everything another inch inside the, my van. Just haven't gotten around to that yet. But uh, that's how that whole process came about. And I absolutely believe that you should do that. If you have the body lift in this van, several people have blown their engines because they blew their oil pan out because they hit it on a, on a rock or a pipe or whatever. Get it out of the way. So, um, yeah, I think I've covered the whole thing. So I think the plan now is to calm my ass down it seemed like everybody got a big kick out of me being all excited. Oh, straight axle, I could get it done. Yeah, for friggin' nine to ten thousand dollars, probably when it's all said and done. That's a lot of money that I don't have. I would have come up with it. But if I can work a deal, and if Tim can like literally does it for nothing because they they see the future or they can make some money on it, uh, and I'm helping the community. Right? That's a big part of this, the Astro Van Tribe thing, and goes along my overall theme with this whole channel where every video I'm trying to help you out. At the very least, I'm trying to entertain you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go that route first. It makes more sense if it's true what they said. If that all works out and they just make me a set and pop them in and I get to be the guinea pig on that, and then it's only going to cost me money, even if it costs me money for that, and it costs me, I don't know, six to hundred to a thousand dollars. That's still worth it if I had to buy them uh, versus trying to do a straight axle swap. Because again, even if I had to put them in myself, I could do that job in a couple hours on my back. <clears throat> so common sense is prevailing here. I just had to sleep on it. And uh, I think that makes more sense. So that's that's the plan. So now I need to just it's just find the time to do everything I need to do, man. It's just, that's the thing that's killing me. But I will. I'll, I'll reach out. I've got the emails and the guy's phone number and everything. So I'll reach out to him soon, if not this week, next week, and talk to them and set up an appointment for me to drive over there one morning. It'll take a whole day, I'm sure. And uh, But if they know I'm coming, everything will be ready. And uh, that'll be a fun video for you guys. And hopefully that'll all work out. This could be a game changer. Now, when I, when I bought the van, it came with Rancho 9000 something adjustable shocks on the front. They were very fat diameter and they were hitting on, because they fit through the looped steel of the upper control arm. That's where your upper ball joints mounted. And one of the things you have to do when you do the lift on this thing is what's called the ball joint flip. This doesn't have anything to do with the shock, but I'll just mention it. The ball joint typically mounts on top of that control arm and feeds through it. Ball joint flip is you just unbolt it and put that underneath the control arm. So it gives you a little more lift there and you can get your uh, front end alignment back into factory spec. Now, all that's done. But what was happening with those rancher shocks is they were dented from that control arm hitting it. Now, I went to a Gabriel shock, and the reason I did that, and I found the right ones from a 1978 K body, I think, is if I'm saying that right. I think it's War Off Road on YouTube. Obviously, an avid four wheel guy, off roader. He has the Astro van, it's like a maroon color one. <laughs> It might be a GMC Safari then because of that with the color. But uh, he, he did everything we all do with the lift, did the ball joint flip and everything, and he found that shock. He did all the math and figured out that's the right shock. It gives you full uh, um, articulation, more articulation, because it allows the wheel to drop further after you do the ball joint flip and everything else. <clears throat> so I bought those and put them on, and they're narrower than the ranches that were on there. So now I've got a solid from the shock to the axle that's on there now, right? The factory axle, it's not the factory anymore. These are the, the Cardones I think I put on. 
If I was going to go the next time, I might try the GSPs, but the Cardones are working okay. No torn rubber boots or anything so far. Everything's golden. But uh, from the, the shaft of the CV to the shock, I've got over an inch now. It's like an inch and an eighth, something like that on both sides. So the Timken uh, CV axle, like well, we're getting all technical, is obviously a fatter shaft. So that's, I think, where the math is there. That's what they've got to look at, if that's enough room. I'm going to take a guess that the Timken is, a, you know, obviously it's a fatter diameter, but I'm going to guess it's not that drastic. But I don't know. I don't know. I might be able to find that spec if I look that up so and kind of figure it out for myself. But I think it would be worth driving over there. Uh, certainly would be worth the video. Uh, even if it turns out that there's not enough room, it'd still be an interesting video for you guys to see. And then, you know, for sure, cause I'm probably not the only guy who's come up with this. You know, I am shocked that I do come up with things all my entire life, all the time. I get into something, I teach myself how to do something. I learn it. I immerse myself in it and I do come up with ideas that it seems like nobody else has come up with. At least there's no evidence of it, especially with the bicycle world. This whole thing with the Schwinn's on, on the on the rear of the Schwinn bikes, they'll have a piece of metal there. If it's if it's a semicircle, that's called a fender bridge. If it comes off the two uh, seat stays, if it comes up flat across and comes back down, well, that's called a brake bridge where you can mount a caliper brake side pull. <clears throat> well, if you want to put a rear brake on your bike and it's got a fender bridge, you'd have to buy this adapter which people charge a friggin' arm and a leg for, <clears throat> just a little piece of metal that sticks in there and has a 90 degree bend with a threaded, uh, uh, like a screw thread on there so you can mount a brake. Well, I came up with a contraption using like mountain bike brake parts and some other stuff to make all that happen. <laughs> it works flawlessly. <laughs> Nobody's seen that before. Everybody freaked out over it. And everybody's passed that information around. And it's weird for me to come into this all these decades later, people building clunkers and never figured that one out. So I know that I have a brain that works and I figure this stuff and I make things work. It's what I do for a living. I design and build furniture out of my skull, use my hands. It's the Zorba the Greek method and just make it happen. I'm just, I'm humble about it. I don't walk around thinking I'm some kind of genius or something. So, uh, there, when there's a will, there's a way again. Never wanted to, nor have I tried, nor have I thought that I wanted to turn this van into a rock crawler. I don't even want to do rock. I've done it with Jeeps before. I've gone out there. It's a pain in the ass too, especially if there's like a line of Jeeps and spotters and everything. It takes all fucking day to go 50 yards. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. And not, not my thing. <laughs> no big deal. And it beats the hell out of your body. You know, you, you, all this stuff going on all day long you come home you're sore from that not interested in it uh, but because of where i've been and the things i've seen and other breakdowns and i've been four wheeling since i was a kid with friends back east um i want obviously this van to be as robust as possible uh in a common sense way <clears throat> so and keep in mind, with all the improvements I've done right now, this thing, you know, ever since I did the computer relearn after I replaced all the sensors, pretty much, I can't think of a sensor I haven't replaced. Spider injection twice, you know, everything I went through when I was having the misfire issue and everything else with the new parts trying to sync, get going to a shop and having them plug in the computer and going through the process of doing the relearn with the new computer and everything else. This thing is perfect. She's running like a top. No more issues. Great on the highway. And with the way I set up the suspension, with the rear end, with the S10 springs and the coil over Gabriel's, it's awesome. And this thing handles like it's on rails at speed. You know, and in the city, it's great. Having bigger tires with uh, terrible city streets and everything just rolls over now, the potholes and everything. Ever since I replaced those front shocks, you'll, you might notice there's a lot less shake in the camera when I'm driving, unless I'm hitting the bad potholes. It's been awesome. So I think I've been pretty smart about it. Uh, 
of course, the purists, uh, you're not smart at all. You waste all that money. It's a freaking Astro van. Doesn't even have a full frame. <laughs> Try being a little less curmudgeonly, you know? <laughs> Read what you what you post before you post, before you hit the send button and be like, hmm, do I sound kind of curmudgeonly? I wonder. Do other people think I'm kind of curmudgeonly? Hmm. Hmm. How many friends do I have? How many people call and check in on me and see how I'm doing? <laughs> like I, I feel for some, I'm, I'm like, I, I sorrowful for some of you guys sometimes. Cause I think, man, with that kind of attitude, which you just be a bad moment. I have them all the time. But if, if you're like that a lot, like most of the time, I just feel bad for you because there, there can't be a lot of people around that want to be around you. <laughs> Although, maybe that's a smart move because having a lot of people around you and needing things from you and asking and wanting your time and everything else is very distracting. It hurts me. It hurts me for getting, being productive. Maybe you're onto something. Wait a second. Maybe I'm doing a 180 on this. Screw this, man. The hell with all you people. I'm going to start getting more curmudgeon. That's me, the curmudgeon. Yeah!